Back in March, Apple introduced their very own credit card to the audience's surprise. There were virtually no rumors about Apple making a credit card, and for some people, the idea didn't make much sense. Why would Apple, a technology company, enter the financial services market? Well, that's exactly what we're going to find out. This is Greg with Apple Explained, and I want to thank Nightstand for sponsoring this video. If you want to help decide which topics I cover, make sure you're subscribed, and these voting polls will show up in your mobile activity feed. Now, although this video is about Apple's credit card, we have to zoom out and see the bigger picture in order to understand Apple's strategy, because this is something much greater than a single product or service. And it all started when Apple was faced with one of their biggest fears, the slowdown of their primary source of revenue, hardware sales. Now, obviously, Apple knew this would happen someday, and they took a few approaches to preventing slowing hardware sales from eating into their revenue growth. First, they began raising prices. Over the past few years, the price of a flagship iPhone went up from $650 to $1,000, the price of an iPad Pro went up from $650 to $800, the price of an Apple Watch went up from $330 to $400, the price of a MacBook Air went up from $1,000 to $1,200, and the price of a Mac Mini went up from $500 to $800. Never in Apple's history had we seen such exorbitant and deliberate price hikes across all product categories. And it was clear the reason why, especially when Apple decided to stop reporting unit sales and instead provide revenue earnings for each product category. But that wasn't the only way Apple planned on combating slow hardware sales. They also tried establishing a stronger presence in large foreign markets like China and India, where they hadn't seen much success in the past. But this proved to be more complicated than perhaps even Apple expected. Customers in China are much more price conscious than in the US, and considering the iPhone XS starts at $1,220 in China, it isn't surprising that most customers consider Apple products out of reach. Not to mention that smartphones are tough to differentiate in China, since virtually everyone uses the same app, WeChat, as a sort of proxy operating system to call, send messages, make purchases, pay bills, find local restaurants, book doctor appointments, hail taxis, hold video conferences, use banking services, and even access their virtual government ID card. So for many Chinese customers, iOS and Android is irrelevant when both platforms offer their true platform of choice, WeChat. So as you might have guessed, Apple was never able to make much headway in the Chinese market. And when it came to India, Apple faced a similar problem of being priced out of the market due to import taxes. They tried negotiating for lower tariffs and the opportunity to build Apple stores in the country, but India upheld their standards that foreign companies have to meet in order to have access to the Indian market. For example, manufacturing the products in the country and sourcing at least 30% of its components from Indian companies. So while their strategy of price hikes worked out as planned, their expansion into China and India did not. But Apple had one more idea to generate additional revenue, which was to aggressively expand their services category. Because not only is it their fastest growing revenue source, but Apple can expect customers to pay for services more reliably than hardware. For example, if you're an Apple Music subscriber and enjoy the service, you'll likely continue to pay the monthly $10 subscription for many, many years until you decide to use a different streaming service or find a different way to listen to music altogether. But those situations are far less likely to happen compared to you buying an iPhone and then deciding to switch to Android after a couple years. And this isn't even considering the fact that by entrenching users in as many of their services as possible, Apple is more likely to keep customers in their ecosystem. If you're using iCloud Drive and Apple News, you're far less likely to buy non-Apple products since they wouldn't allow you to use most of the Apple services you're familiar with. Now you probably remember the Apple event back in March, where several new services like Apple TV+, Apple News+, and Apple Arcade were announced. Their introductions were fairly underwhelming, since many rumors leading up to the event were spot on in predicting the services Apple would reveal. That is, all except one. When Apple announced their own credit card, it came as a surprise and left many people wondering why Apple decided to make it. After all, credit cards are financial products traditionally offered by banks. So why would a technology company enter that market? Well, there are a few really good reasons, but I want to start off by providing a little bit of Apple history. Because with any new product or service Apple has released since Tim Cook became CEO, there are always people who say, Steve Jobs would have never let that happen. And I heard this a lot in regards to their new credit card. But what most people don't know is that Steve Jobs actually wanted Apple to make their own credit card. 
Back in 2004, Jobs tried negotiating a deal with MasterCard to create an Apple credit card that would offer users iPoints, which could then be redeemed for free music. The project got pretty far along since there had already been an ad campaign created in preparation of its release. But unfortunately, Jobs wasn't able to get the terms he wanted with MasterCard, so the Apple credit card project was abandoned altogether. Although if we go back even further into Apple's history, we discover that they did in fact release several consumer and business credit cards in the 80s and 90s, and they came with some incredible signing bonuses, like $2,500 of instant Apple credit when approved. That's about $5,500 today adjusted for inflation, which is unbelievably generous for simply signing up for a credit card. Now, eventually Apple stopped offering these cards, but it's important to understand that the concept of an Apple credit card isn't as inconceivable as it may appear. Now, let's figure out why it'd be a good idea for Apple to offer a credit card to begin with. And the first reason has to do with Apple Pay. If you remember back in 2014 when Apple Pay was introduced, Apple wanted it to become the most common way their users made purchases. But this didn't end up being the case. Adoption of Apple Pay by retailers moved painfully slow year after year and made things frustrating for users, who weren't sure which stores accepted the payment method. So half the time, trying to use Apple Pay was more of a hassle than it was worth since it ended up not working anyway. Apple also faced opposition from major retailers like Target, Walmart, Best Buy, CVS, and 7-Eleven since they were already developing their own mobile payment system called Currency. It's also important to point out the privacy features of Apple Pay that retailers weren't happy about. If you use something like Walmart Pay, which uses Currency technology, or even traditional debit and credit cards, the retailer is able to create a shopper profile for each customer that would track their spending habits and deploy sales tactics like emailing coupons or promotions in order to encourage more spending. But if retailers adopted Apple Pay, they'd no longer be able to do this, which is seen as detrimental to their business. So in an effort to push the adoption of Apple Pay more aggressively and encourage its use among users, Apple decided to integrate their credit card with the service and offer 2% cash back if Apple Pay is used to make purchases. This will incentivize people to make transactions with Apple Pay while also putting pressure on retailers to adopt the payment method for the convenience of their customers. The second reason why Apple made a credit card is its huge revenue potential. Although it's unknown what kind of revenue split Apple and MasterCard agreed to, it is known that banks generate an unbelievable amount of money from credit card interest, and Apple is looking to cut a piece of that pie for themselves. In fact, the average American carries about $5,300 worth of credit card debt month to month. And at an average interest rate of 17%, that's about $900 a month that every credit card user is generating for their issuing bank. So if Apple theoretically has 1 million cardholders and shares 50% of their revenue with MasterCard, they'd still be making hundreds of millions of dollars every month off of interest. But this huge potential for revenue isn't the only reason why an Apple credit card is a good idea. It also encourages people to stay in Apple's ecosystem by offering 3% cash back on purchases from Apple and giving users an incredible way to track their spending and organize their monthly payments. Apple was in the perfect position as the creator of iOS to integrate incredible software features that differentiates their credit card from others. Not only is it primarily a virtual card that you can apply for through iOS, but it's issued to you just minutes after approval, so you don't have to wait on the physical card to show up in the mail before using it. Now, that may not seem very impressive to young people who are used to doing everything online, but it's a completely new approach to credit cards that we haven't seen many banks take before. And while the Apple Cards reward program isn't the most generous in the industry, it is simple and straightforward. You get instant cash back on all purchases made with the card. That's it. No point system or waiting for your cash back at the end of each billing cycle. So if you take a step back and look at the Apple credit card from a strategic perspective, it's easy to see why creating it was such a good decision for Apple. It'll generate a large source of revenue for the company, which is something they need. It offers improvements and conveniences that other cards on the market don't, which is great for consumers. And it'll be most appealing to Apple's own users, which will keep them even more rooted in Apple's ecosystem. The card is set to be released this summer, and that'll help us gauge just how successful Apple's entry into the financial market will be. And while you may have to wait a while before getting the Apple Card, you don't have to wait to get the most comprehensive charging solution for your Apple products called the Nightstand Quad. 
they're actually offering you guys 20% off with the code Apple Explained, which is really generous. I've been using this base station for a couple weeks, and it's definitely the most convenient way to charge all of my devices. There's a spot for my iPhone, AirPods, Apple Watch, and even my iPad, which is something rarely offered in charging solutions I've seen in the past. And to be honest, I rarely have all of my devices charging at the same time, so I've actually been using one of the lightning docks as an Apple remote holder, which has been a lifesaver since now I always know where it's at and it's always fully charged. Something else that's really come in handy is the USB port on the back of the base station. It allows me to power my phone while using it at the same time, which is especially nice before bed when my battery is low. Not to mention how much cleaner my nightstand looks without power cables all over the place. So make sure you check out nightstand.com to find a base station that'll work best for you, and don't forget to use coupon Apple Explained for 20% off. Alright guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.